uh, just look things over here real quick. Okay. So we got a pretty full slate. We got 17 out of 19 training programs, so we should be good to go. Or 18 training programs. So, uh, welcome everybody to the EMS Practical Evaluator Workshop. One of a couple steps for you to be able to evaluate the uh, state and national registry exams for EMTs, EMRs, AMTs, and paramedics. Uh, this is kind of a general overview of the information you should know before doing evaluations, and there'll be some specific stuff that your training program will take you through uh, with the hands-on and how to fill out the paperwork and how to actually do the evaluations themselves. So as we go through, I'll try to pause every once in a while to see if there's any questions. If I start to ramble, someone reel me in. I am in an office all by myself this time of night, so I am just talking out into space right now. And uh, my mind tends to wander when I do that. There we go. So like I said, this is part of what you need to do to become an evaluator. Uh, your training program, after they have taken you through the orientation they want to do with you, will file an uh, evaluator endorsement application for you. They'll do that through the system registry, and we'll go check those off and look for those to come in next couple weeks. Once you have that then and your training program says you're good to go, that means you can evaluate for them for the, like I said, the uh, certification examinations. So this is, like I said, part of what you need to do because the rest of it's really on your training program to make sure you are actually familiar with the practical examination requirements, how to do it, uh, the steps to go through, and hopefully they give you some oversight before turning you loose to evaluate. What you do with the evaluator is pretty darn important for us. Uh, you really are one of the people helping make sure that the providers we give licenses to function to are actually competent to do their jobs and likewise to make sure the people that are not competent to do their jobs don't get the uh, certification. Give me a second, I'm receiving a message here. Just going to see we're having problems. Okay. So Tina, you're good there? I'm assuming that meant she can hear me now. All right. So there's a lot of steps to this to get where they go on. So before they can come and do the evaluation, they've gone through their education and their training programs. What we're trying to do with the training program aspect of it is make sure students are actually capable of doing, their, doing the skills they need to do before they come do the evaluation. And then also preparing the students for the evaluation process. So to be able to do this, we try to make sure everything is on the up and up. There's no surprises, no tricks to coming in and doing the psychomotor examination. We have the National Registry has all their information on the evaluation tools available on their website. That way people can use those. That way they know what is expected of them. You can train the students using those things so they know what steps they'll need to go through to do the skills. Everybody's kind of using the same materials for instruction, the teaching, the evaluators, the students. And then what we try to do is make this a direct reflection of education and work, which we'll talk more about because we are in the process of changing things up a little bit down the road. In 2017, we're going to be, see a pretty dramatic change in the way we evaluate the paramedics for the National Registry exam, and that's to try to get it more work-like at that level and be able to do critical thinking, evaluate that. So psychomotor evaluation, a lot of people ask, why do we do this? Training programs train people. They should all be ready to go when they hit the door. They've already done the psychomotor evaluations in the training programs. Uh, no, we hear a lot that other healthcare professions don't do a psychomotor examination. Uh, I'll tell you from talking to the boards of nursing and some other groups, they don't do it because they never have. They don't know how to make it happen now that they don't have it. A lot of them would have started off the way we have in EMS is have some sort of psychomotor evaluation if they could have from, again, what I'm being hearing from those type of licensing agencies. So we do have this, and what we want to do is to make sure that people can actually do the skills they need to do to function as EMS providers. Some huge advantages to, the, to doing psychomotor evaluation is we can put people in situations similar to what they're going to work in the field. 
and see if they have the psychomotor skills and leadership skills. And again, leadership skills being a bigger step in the paramedic down the road when we do the change to some scenario-based uh, evaluation for them. The disadvantages is A, it's very difficult to standardize. We know this, that's why we try to make the tools as simple as possible and as uh, foolproof as possible, but there's always the room for interpretation. As we go through this, I'll kind of bring out some things that we see commonly or common misperceptions people have about how things have to be done that they carry over to their evaluation. The psychomotor evaluation is also very time consuming and labor intensive. If you haven't been part of a practical before, uh, talk to your training program director. It costs a lot of money to bring all those people into the evaluation and it takes all day. And I know that from experience because I used to go to every test in the state when we did it all when we were the National Registry uh, um, reps for all the exams in the state before we had some independent reps go and do this. And I know that you knew you were just going to shoot at least an entire day doing an evaluation no matter how many students you came in it seemed like. So everybody's got some responsibilities in this game talked a little bit about the training programs already. They're the ones who are going to prepare the students, identify them as being ready to go take the examination, hopefully got them ready, those students ready to go take the examination and become candidates to test. And this is becoming a bigger deal with some of the new standards going in by uh, COA uh, Co or COEMSP, some of the requirements the registry is going to have for portfolios at the paramedic level is something we've talked about a lot, but now is really getting ingrained in our educational process. So the responsibility of the training program is to document students that actually know how to do these skills based off the current scope of practice, the current policies and procedures, the way the skills are being done. Uh, the training program needs to evaluate at some level that students are doing those skills correctly. Then when the training programs, who set, a lot of the training programs also set up the evaluations for the National Registry exam, they also have to make sure they use qualified evaluators. So that means those people have the evaluator endorsement and also that they have seen those people evaluate at some level, know they're qualified to evaluate, just not have some sort of mark on a card, well, not even a card anymore, but have some sort of letter on, the, on their uh, uh, website profile saying they're an evaluator. That's not something you can just take at face value. You need to make sure those are qualified evaluators. Now, we don't require training programs to use endorsed evaluators during the course itself, but some will do that just to make sure they have somebody who's gone through the process and they feel comfortable with doing the evaluation for maybe their terminal competencies or end of course skills. So an issue that comes up a lot, and mostly since we are kind of a tight-knit community EMS, there's only 11,700 of us through the entire state and about 1,000 evaluators and about the same number, maybe a, fewer of, uh, a few less instructors in the state. So we have a kind of a small cadre of people that do things all over the place. So one of the issues we run into then is conflicts of interest. And you're going to hear me mention this several times because this is a big issue. Uh, there's a couple things we don't want to have happen. We don't want to have any student not have a fair evaluation. And we also don't want any student who can make a case they didn't have, an that they didn't have a fair evaluation, even if that evaluation was fair. So if you're an instructor, you cannot evaluate your students. And if you are a limited instructor, you have to be careful about what stations you evaluate. So if you came in and helped do PHTLS for a class and you were one of the PHTLS instructors, you should not be evaluating those students on their trauma assessment or in their trauma skills. It may be appropriate for you to do medical and some of the other stations, but uh, you shouldn't be doing the skills you train people to do. And I'm going to come, I'll cycle back to that a few times. Also with personal and professional relationships, you just don't want to put yourself in the position. If you ever have a question as an evaluator about whether you should be evaluating somebody, talk to the site monitor, the site proctor, ask them if this is appropriate, or if you don't feel it's appropriate, get yourself out of that situation. And they'll find someone else to cover that station for you. Uh, we just, again, want to make sure everybody has a fair evaluation and that nobody can claim they didn't have fair evaluation because of who the evaluator was.
So I kind of let uh, refer to this a little bit already, but just kind of bring this back. How do you get the evaluator endorsement makes you qualified? Well, first, one of the training programs says to recommend you, and they'll do that electronically here after you finish this workshop and you've met whatever the requirements they have. Uh, you have to be certified to perform the skills you're evaluating. So as an EMT, you cannot evaluate intubation unless you're also a respiratory therapist or you have some sort of qualification that allows you to do that. And then you need to be knowledgeable in the skill, equipment, and procedure. And that's part of what the training program needs to do is make sure that you actually know how the evaluation works. So it's more than just listen to me talk for a couple hours and then you're good to go. The training program also needs to qualify you and make sure that you are set to be an evaluator and know what you're doing. Any questions or anything so far before we start getting into the actual test itself? Okay. Yeah, we haven't covered much yet, so I didn't expect a whole lot. So let's talk a little about the certification testing. Because there's a lot of people confused about what a certification test is. In fact, we just had to talk about this a little bit with our EMS Advisory Council last week about how a certification examination is different than the test students take in the classroom. Uh, so the tests you take in the classroom and the whole testing process in the classroom, there's both formative and summative evaluations done in the classroom. But most of those are used for to do two things. Let the training program evaluate whether you know what you need to know to be an EMS provider, but also give you feedback as a student to let you know, hey, here's where your gaps are. You have a knowledge gap here. You don't understand this concept. So the, the tests do two things in a classroom setting. A certification exam is not a classroom exam. It's an exam that an individual has to pass to be able to give the privilege to do the job, to be given a certification to go out and actually perform as an EMS provider. So it is not a tool to help an individual evaluate where they are. It is a tool to evaluate whether the person is where they need to be. So it's a formal verification of their abilities isn't there for teaching or remedial. So they don't get feedback about, hey, you need to do this better, or hey, you should have done this, or boy, you did not uh, check the C-spine before putting a C-collar on. That should all be done long before they ever show up to take the National Registry exam or the certification exam. So that's where a lot of people get frustrated that they don't get feedback. The reason they'll get feedback is that's not what the test is there for. It is purely there to identify, does this individual have the minimum competencies to be able to safely practice as an EMS provider? It's not there to give them feedback to say, oh, you should do this differently. You need to do this differently. It is purely a show me you know what you need to know exam. So the skills we do are based off on a couple things. They're based on both the frequency of day in and day out of, out of hospital care. The National Registry does a survey every five years of practicing EMS providers to say, hey, what skills do you do in the pre-hospital environment? How often do you do those skills? What is it possible you harm somebody when you do those skills? So we're looking at a couple things there. Uh, one would be skills that you need to have down well because it could harm the patient if you don't do them right. If there's no real harm to doing the skill incorrectly, we don't test it. Now, you can make argument for something. I guess one of the ones that comes to mind with me would be hand washing. Yes, you need to wash your hands, but it's not a thing we test you on at the National Register exam to see if you know how to wash your hands. There is some risk to it, but it's not as risky as incorrect procedure with an I.O. needle. So that's why we test the things we do test in the National Register exam. So you're there as an evaluator because you have been chosen to do a fair, unbiased, objective-based evaluation on every candidate that comes in to test. Um, and you're going to hear this a lot. We're going to go over this quite a bit, this fair, unbiased, objective, and everybody getting the same exam. Well, that's going to pop up several times in this uh, presentation. 
other thing that keeps popping up is about this conflict of interest thing. If you've got a personal relationship, would like to have a personal relationship, you are working with that person outside of the, the testing environment, if you help teach them, don't put yourself in the situation where you can rise, uh, bring any doubt whether that person had a fair, objective, unbiased evaluation or not. Talk to the proctor on site, get somebody else to test that student if you, or that candidate if you need to. So your qualifications to be an evaluator, besides having the endorsement, is you have licensure at an equivalent level. If you're doing the patient assessment trauma, you need to have, be an instructor for ATLS, PHLS, or ITLS, which actually isn't ITLS anymore. I think it's BTLS now. That's not right. No, it is B ITLS. It changed from BTLS to ATLS. Um, sorry, I digress. To do patient assessment medical, you should have AMLS as recommended to be completed, so you have a good understanding of medical conditions. They recommend, the registry just recommends, does not require that you're doing ventilatory management, that you're an ACLS instructor. And this mostly falls on the advanced exam here. If you're doing cardiac management, both static and dynamic, you need to be an ACLS instructor. If you're doing cardiac management with AAD, you need to be a BLS instructor. And pediatric skills, they've always recommended a PALS instructor, but there's a lot of other uh, pediatric courses out there now that don't have a true instructor designation. So as long as the training program using that individual as an evaluator can document that that person has good solid knowledge in pediatrics, it's an, probably an appropriate person to use. Again, it goes back to do you really know how to do this skill? So I almost don't even like the term evaluator. You're not going to know what the pass-fail criteria are. Um, we don't want you to know that. We want you, again, not to be so much judging the patient as documenting or the candidate as observing and documenting what they do. I'm going to go through some different forms here later, but we only evaluate what's listed on the evaluation form. That's, again, how we try to get the consistency that every candidate across the nation is getting a very similar exam, whether you're testing in Florida or you're testing in North Dakota. If you're taking a national register exam, you should be evaluated on the same thing no matter where you're at. Let me give you an example. I had a situation several years ago where this is when I was doing the registry pro or the registry rep. I, we bring the candidates when we give them the results and ask them if they had any issues, if there's anything they felt they were discriminated against, if they had any equipment issues. And I heard from a candidate that they were thrown when the person in airway management was asking them qu questions about, well, how much oxygen do you give if you have a nasal cannula at four liters per minute? And they weren't prepared for that because that's not part of the testing. We had to stop the test, go back and see if anybody had failed that station and then not count that station against them they had because they didn't really have a fair evaluation. They were not prepared for that. They weren't going in for a cognitive exam. They were supposed to be evaluated on what was on the evaluation form. So going off script causes us some problems. Another one of your duties as evaluators is make sure all that paperwork is complete. Um, I'll tell you from back in the tally room, you have a lot of forms coming in, you got a lot of people you're trying to keep track of, and that registered rep is trying to make sure everybody's got complete forms. When incomplete forms come in that aren't signed, the totals aren't totaled up, or there's blanks, we have to stop your station get back in there for you to fill it out, start to have backlogs of the student candidates wanting to test, and then everything that's coming in at that time is not getting uh, sorted and piled and tallied up in the tally room. So little things like just not getting those things signed will bring a standstill to when people get the results, how smoothly the test functions. So, Consider it to be like a patient care report. Don't let it go out of your room. Don't hand it over until you make sure everything's complete. So 
So any questions you may have about performance, what's allowed, what's not allowed, should be visited with the site proctor, not with the candidates or not with anybody, other fellow evaluators. Whoever's your site proctor, whether it's a BLS exam and it's a, or a EMR, EMT exam, and it's gonna be staff of the training program, or for an AEMT or paramedic exam, it'll be the National Registry rep that's there. Ask them about what's appropriate. Uh, we are training, we are testing people on national standards, not what your local protocol says you have to do or your personal preference. And invariably, the one that causes the most problems for this is the KED board. Because everybody has a special way they think the straps have to go on and that's the only way straps can go on. And if you read the manufacturer sheets on that, it's actually as long as you attach the torso before you secure the head, all is fine. It doesn't have to be top strap, middle strap, bottom strap, this strap, that strap, and then hold your tongue a certain way to do it all together. As long as it's got a torso secured before the head, it's allowable. So you have questions about what's allowable, what's not, talk to that site proctor, they'll help you out. Some of the scenarios have, uh, some of the stations have scenarios with them. You will not know what those scenarios are till the day of the test. Uh, they are a surprise for everybody, including the people who've set up the exam that day. Uh, for the nat for the advanced exam, usually they don't know what station they're doing for the random station until the uh, register rep shows up and tells them which one they're going to do. So when you do that scenario, you're going to need some time to get familiarize yourself with that, read through it, understand it, make sure you know what you're actually testing, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that flow goes here in a little bit. I'm going to talk about some of the other people that are going to be present to, oh wait, I'm ready, one more, a couple more slides in, I'll have a spot for questions. So documentation, I've talked about this, and we will come back to this, and I'll look at some of the forms here in a little bit. But the documentation form, treat them just like you do a patient care report. Uh, these things do pop back out in legal issues every once in a while or uh, cases. I know I've had to use them for national registry or for uh, issues we've had come up. We've had to go ask the registry to make copies of these and send them to us. And uh, it does reflect on you as an evaluator how you fill out the form, just like a patient care report reflects on you as a caregiver on how you fill out the form. Uh, they ask you to identify both good and poor performance. And then there's critical criteria you'll see here in a little bit. And I know a lot of you have been through these stations. Probably everybody that's sitting out there has been through these. So you always know at the bottom there's some critical criteria. Anytime a critical criteria is documented, we need the factual documentation about why. What was the thing that made that be wrong? And we'll talk about those when I pull up some forms here. We'll kind of show you some common issues that show up with those. Another thing is that your critical criteria at the bottom need to correspond with what's going on up above. So you give somebody a point for using correct body substance isolation, but you check critical criteria, they fail to use body substance isolation, those two don't jive together. So usually the student, the candidate will get the benefit of the doubt, and if you check yes, they did it, that's how that's going to be tallied up. But we'll look at some of those and some of the issues that come up with those. So you're not going to know if the candidate, I say that kind of with a wink, but for the most part, you don't know what the exact criteria are. You don't know exactly how many points they need to be a pass versus a fail. Uh, you know, if they come in our total train wreck on the station, you're going to know, yeah, they, they got zero points, they're probably not going to pass. But you don't know where the exact cutoff is. Only the site proctor knows that. They have a super secret decoder ring that they use to do this. Uh, one of the reasons we don't want you to know is we don't want you to be influenced at all about whether you should give a point or not. You know, you think, man, this candidate, a lot. They, they did really good, but I know they're one point short. I'm just going to give them this point or boy, I didn't like the way they did this, but boy, they scored enough points. If I give them one less point, they won't pass. That's out of your hands that way. You don't have to worry about where they're at. We just want you to document what happens, give it over, and then the site proctor will review it and make a decision about whether it was a pass or fail, depending on the criteria we have established. And then they'll notify the candidate. And again, then the candidate will be upset because they won't know what they failed, but 
that's how it works. They're supposed to have known that already before they came in, what their weaknesses may be. So they will notify the candidate how they did based off the evaluation you completed. Any questions at this point? And I am watching my chat box too when I stop, If uh, see if anybody types anything in if you don't have a mic on your end. It's a quiet group out there tonight. Okay, I'll keep watching the chat box. I also got my email up. If anybody wants to email me with any questions, it should come up or text. Okay, so you may have a couple other people in the room with you, depending on the station and what, what you're doing. You may have an assistant. Now, the assistant is... Uh, it has to be a certified provider because they are going to function as a certified provider. They are considered to be a competent EMS provider who can do what they're told. They're considered to be the same level as the individual that they're working with, so they can provide assistance at that level. Uh, and again, they're competent. They're not going to do things to trick people up. They sh cannot save nor fail a student by or candidate by their actions. Again, I have an example of this from several years ago. We had a uh, evaluator doing, um, I think it was seated immobilization, if I remember right. And that evaluator would have the assistant let go of C-spine to see whether the candidate would identify that the assistant let go. And if the assistant let go of C-spine and the candidate didn't identify it, they failed the candidate in that station. Uh, who they should have failed should have been the assistant for letting go of C-spine. You can't do that. It's not part of the evaluation process to see if they can ride a herd over the assistant. These people got enough stress, enough stress in their life the day they come in a test uh, without people playing games with them. Uh, you cannot use current students in the assistant. Again, we want that fair, unpartial, unbiased thing, so we don't want people they've just gone through class with being in there. And they're not needed for every station, just some stations have the assistant. There may also be a patient. That patient also needs to be an EMS person because they're going to act like a sick or injured person. Uh, it's key that they act the same with every candidate. They can't be moaning and yelling and screaming with one patient or one candidate that comes in and they be totally lethargic and non-responsive with the second one. Uh, because again, we're trying to give the same test to every candidate that comes through. So it's important that the patient knows what's expected of them and acts in a similar fashion each time. Uh, you definitely can ask your both your assistant and your patient for input. There's a lot to watch on some of these stations as an evaluator, and if you're trying to document things, you may not always be watching when they do something. So if you're curious whether they uh, palpated the femur, you can ask your assistant, you know, did they grab your leg? Did they, did they palpate your leg? They can definitely give you that sort of feedback and let you know what was or was not done, but you do have final say. If you don't feel it was done well, you can mark no. The registry is also allowing high fidelity mannequins to be used for the patient role. And we are, our stations, except for the pediatric station, the pediatric airway and the pediatric IO, everything is calibrated to be the adult patient. So you need to have somebody 16 years of age and normal height, normal weight. Uh, somebody, the equipment is going to fit correctly. So you have a real tiny 16 year old, don't use them in the Kedboard station because the Kedboard's not going to fit them, right? You almost need a smaller Kedboard than normal. Uh, you're not, you're trying to make sure they know the baseline in a s normal situation, not necessarily going to test them this day on how to do the out of normal situations. Can you know, give a little pause there before we start to jump in the stations and talk about things to do in the different stations? OK. 
Okay. I got a quick question from Western Iowa Tech. Yes. Hey, if you're a paramedic for a service and a student uh, rides a lot at your service, how does that work for an evaluator then? Is that a conflict of interest? Did you actually proctor the student? Well, like if the student was riding along with you in, in the ambulance all day for several shifts, is that a conflict of interest? And you were the preceptor for the student, though? That's, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good chance it's going to be a conflict of interest. It depends by a lot what you mean. You know, a lot as an EMT is going to be different than a lot for a paramedic. Okay. So if it's a EMT student, you saw them for two shifts, that's going to be different than a paramedic student you may have been 10, 15 shifts with, spending a lot of time together. Okay. So usually the... Uh, now, usually the training program knows who they've spent time with and will have a good clue on that if you need to have somebody else take a look at that student or evaluate that student. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. Any other questions? All right, well, let's look at some of the stations and what we're doing right now. So the EMR and EMT tests are done by the training programs on behalf of the Bureau using the National Registry materials. Um, technically, it says the National Registry says it will use a state-approved practical. They have a sample practical. We've adopted that practical to be our state-approved practical exam. Uh, the site proctor then is identified by the sponsoring training program. Most of the time, from what I see anyway, that seems to be the training program director as functions that site proctor. Occasionally they'll bring somebody else in if they have schedule issues, but a lot of times it's that site, uh, the training program director. So the EMR has five stations they do. I'm not going to read them to you. They're up there. But we do want to see, you know, can they assess a trauma patient? Can they de develop a uh, uh, treatment decisions when they do that? Same thing with the medical patients. Can they bag valve mass an apneic patient? Can they get oxygen by non-rebreather? And do they know how to do a cardiac arrest AED? Again, the frequent things they do that probably have the most complexity to them. It's, you know, talking to a patient, figuring out what to do, assessing a patient, figuring out what to do, and then some of these life-saving interventions with oxygenation and cardiac arrest and respiration. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how testing and retesting goes down. Um, EMRs get two full attempts to pass the exam. When they make their first attempt at the exam, they can fail two stations and have a retest underneath that attempt. And they have two retests for every attempt. So the one I threw up here is an example. We have, I got station A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or D, F, G. I skipped E for some reason. Interesting, because I don't know my alphabet apparently. So candidate one, or this candidate goes in, on their first attempt, they pass station A, they fail B and C, they pass station D, they pass station F, they pass station G. They get to retest underneath the first attempt. When they do the second, when they do their first retest, it's what we call first attempt, first retest. They just test the stations they fail. This candidate passed station C, but failed station B for a second time. If they had passed both, they would have been done, they would have been successful in their first attempt, and things would have moved along for this person. But now they need to do a second attempt. So this is their first attempt, second retest. If they pass this, everything's good, but this candidate failed that station. So they now failed their first attempt. They have to do remedial training and then go take the entire five stations over again. And then that will enter their second attempt, but the same thing goes down. They fail their second attempt, they'll have to take the entire class over again. So 
So most of the training programs don't allow people to do their second retest on the same day. If they've already filled a station twice, most of them will tell that candidate, you know, you need to go back and look at your stuff and get ready because it's kind of high stakes when you take that second retest because if you fail that, you're going to do remedial training before you're allowed to test again. You'll have to file something with the registry showing you've done the remedial training or document it in the file for the EMT and EMR levels. Any questions on that and kind of how it works? Because this kind of plays out throughout all the levels now. You guys are accelerated class. It took me a while to get my head around that when I started doing this. Okay, so the EMTs, they have, I have to count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stations to do. So all the same stations that the EMRs did, plus spinal mobilization of supine patient, and then they have some sort of random skill that they won't know what they're doing until they show up to test. The random skills include these. And right now we're on a weekly rotation of those. So we change them up every week. So if you test this week, it's going to be a different test than what you go to next week. However, if you fail a random basic skill, for your retest, you have to do the same random basic skill. So if you if you just suck at bleeding control shock management and you fail it the first time, you don't get to say, yay, I won't do that again because next week it will be something different. Nope. You've got to pass bleeding control shock management because you've just proved you're not competent in doing that. So there are times it's evaluated. If you're doing random basic skills, you may be doing a day long of joint immobilization, then they have a student come in and say, this student needs to have bleeding control shock management. We have to do that one for them. EMTs get two full attempts also. They can retest up to three skills when making their full attempt. So like your EMT, your EMR could have two and have to retest. An EMT can have three and get a retest. If they fail four or more, they're going to have to take their second full attempt after documenting remedial training. Everybody with me there? Joe, at some point in time in the past, did they have three full attempts, or is that just my bad memory? Underneath the first responder and EMT basic, they did. Okay, that's what I'm thinking then. And then when we transitioned, they transitioned it to what they, what they saw is that people that didn't pass in two didn't pass in three. So when the registry did that, they figured that it, why, because it's so expensive to do this, why linger it out just if they don't get it done in two, we don't see them pass it on the third attempt. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into the advanced skills now. Because this does get to be a little bit different beast. It's almost a little more formal. You're going to have a national registry rep there. Uh, so you got an outside, un, another un, layer of unbiased people there, and they're going to oversee how this is all done. So I kind of got this backwards. I jumped in with AMT. I should have flipped those slides. Uh, AMT will have two full attempts at the practical exam, just like the EMT and the EMR does. Uh, if they fail four or less skills, they can retest two times. So five is their magic number of going to take everything all over or have to go take all the stations over again. Their current stations are patient assessment trauma medical, then an alternative airway device that varies a little bit across the nation. They have to be able to test all the different ones that are available. Um, but it does vary sometimes about where exa what exactly is being used different places. Cardiac arrest management AD, starting IV and giving a bolus medication, dealing with the pediatric IO and respiratory compromise, the supine patient immobilization, then a random skill. The 
random skill will be one of these, and again, they won't know that until the day they walk in. Usually, the National Register rep will announce it to everybody uh, when they're in the morning, right before the test. current paramedic skills and I need to go pull out a different presentation to show you the new stuff but uh, the current paramedics are these stations again we're doing a change in 2017 and there'll be a lot of time for you to get that and then the random stations for the paramedic And this is the new exam, and it's for classes starting, somebody correct me if I'm misunderstanding this, have this wrong, but it's for classes starting after August 1st, 2016, so the implementation of this will really be the beginning, you probably January 2017 at the earliest for most programs. Is that the most, that's the most current stuff the registry is pushing out, isn't it? Anybody have, hear anything different at this point? I'm gonna assume I'm right unless because no one's jumped all over me about it. So in as far as I know. This change occurs. Oh go ahead. No, I just said that looks right as far as I know. Okay. So the stations we tested in will be some of the traditional stations we've had all the time. But then there's gonna be one of an out of hospital scenario. Let me give you a little history on where this came from and how we got to this point. When we went to all COA accredited paramedic programs in 2013, discussion started with the, the registry about, okay, we have accredited programs now that have site visitors go in and look at them, have a entity that's going to say, yes, they're, they are doing training like they should. Uh, that was really the push for some of this detailed practical we've had is we didn't have this sort of verification before so the registry started talking about okay now we have this verification is there a different way we can do the practical examination at this point so they piloted it in some different testing models and the, what they did with this is say okay if training programs develop a portfolio for each of their students so have a record of during the course, they started a certain number of IVs with a certain level of proficiency. They intubated a certain number of, patient, number of patients with a certain number, a certain level of proficiency. They they did the skills at a level of proficiency that everybody that the training program is comfortable with and can document. We wouldn't have to go test them on IVs because we know they started IVs. There was some work done out of Minnesota through FISDAP on the uh, what's called a Eureka point. And the Eureka point is that you can trend successful and unsuccessful skills, and there's a point where candidates get it, or where students get it. You know, after a certain number of IVs, they are consistently going to get IVs done successfully. You know, and they'll have some misses because no one's 100% on IVs. Well, there may be somebody, but I wasn't. But there's a point that happens where someone gets it. So knowing if you have a documentation that, yes, this person can successfully start IVs and is competent in doing it, why bring them into a test scenario and have them stick a plastic arm to say, oh, yes, you know how to start an IV? So when they did that, they thought, well, okay, maybe we could do all testing by scenarios then. And I was lucky to get the chance to go up and see some of this pilot work that was done. Uh, they did a test up in in Minnesota, I got invited to come up to observe, observe it. They actually had a three-member crew go in, so you had three candidates go in and do three different stations. And one station, candidate A would be the team leader and the other two would be the assistants. And you would evaluate the team leader on how well they coordinated the care and did the assessment. 
and you would evaluate the assistance on how well they did the actual skills. If they need to intubate, did they intubate correctly? If they start an IV, did they start IV correctly? Uh, we had a couple things happen with the pilot is, first, it takes a lot of time. We thought three stations would go quicker than 12 stations. It didn't. It went slower. It was hard to evaluate because you had not only the team leader you're trying to evaluate, but you're also trying to evaluate the two assistants. So you actually had a two-person evaluation team, one just watching the assistants, one watching the team leader. Then what did the team leader bomb this station? Do the assistants get punished for that, or the assistants did something wrong? Who gets punished for I mean, does, does the whole crew have to retest? There was just a lot of stuff that came down. They heard back from state agencies saying, hey, if I'm giving a permission to practice based off of your psychomotor examination, we're not quite comfortable with this. So they redid this, re-gigged it, rolling it out now, and we're going to have these stations along with one scenario that the individual, one candidate will go in with a, with a, a primed assistant. It's an, not another candidate, but it's an actual assistant that that's what they're doing that day is being the assistant on this call. And going to evaluate some about the team leadership skills, not so much about how they do individual skills, but how do they manage the patient, manage the scene. It'll be interesting. I think we all have a pretty steep learning curve on that one. It's probably going to be about as steep a learning curve as when the oral station came in in 2000. That was a tough station for people to get their heads around. So you have a trained paramedic partner, then evaluate on the ability to manage a call, to do team lead, uh, direct personnel and resources, communicate, and be professional. It's been an interesting process. They have done some work with what pilots do on how they evaluate pilots on their ability to uh, think critically and deal with issues in flights. And also they brought in a lot of uh, field training officers from across the nation and say, no, for an entry-level EMS provider, what do you expect them to do? And they kind of did a process that way to kind of to evaluate what is entry-level competent for managing a scenario, managing a scene that they got from the people that actually hire and put these people on ambulances across the nation. So a lot of work has gone in this. I'm still interested to see how well flies when we implement it. So the Registry's had some uh, webinars, and I know there's going to be some more coming out. They're actually going to do some face-to-face -face meetings across the nation with us, too, for uh, training programs and evaluators. So you'll hear more about this as the time gets closer to roll it. And I'm still learning quite a bit about it, too. I just spent some time two weeks ago with the Registry talking about it, and I still have quite a bit I need to pick up on this yet. Any questions at this point or anything people want to know that I may or may not be able to answer about the new test? All right. Well, let me go into a little bit about their current test and some of the stations and issues we see with them. So the patient assessment, oh, I should have updated that. Excuse me, I'm making notes. Every once in a while I do a presentation, I see something stupid in it, and I have to make a note to change it for next time. Uh, so the trauma is required for the EMT and the paramedic. And what we're trying to do with this station, the trauma station, is identify whether they can do a patient assessment and figure out management, what needs to be done for that patient. Uh, there's not a whole lot of doing actually thing to the patient is more I'm doing an assessment and here's what I need to do to manage the patient, identifying those priorities. It's a lot required like the medical assessment. Uh, they evaluate the ability to use appropriate interviewing techniques and assess the patient. The paramedic doesn't do the medical station because the oral station takes care of a lot of those skills that the medical station takes in for the AEMT. Common issues to see both these stations is your patient, your your simulated patient needs to be moulaged because again, it's not supposed to be a pretend station. They're supposed to actually go in and do things as realistically as we can make it. So if it says they have uh, cyanosis, they need to be moulaged to have cyanosis. If it says they have a chest injury, they need to be moulaged to have a chest injury. 
So that takes a quite a bit of time to get all that ready in the morning before you kick off too. Uh, having appropriate clothing for those candidates, this is something I've, I have seen over the years a lot of candidates don't get prepared for and primed for. Uh, trauma, for the trauma station, they're going to be stripped naked. So not naked, but they need to have appropriate underwear underneath or undergarments underneath it that, that are not going to be uh, exposed when clothes come off. Uh, for a trauma patient, you got to be able to open up the clothing and evaluate. A lot of the training programs have scrubs that have already been cut and they're taped together. That way they can open them up every time. You're just your person coming in needs to know that they're going to be exposed and should probably have a bathing suit or something on underneath. Uh, I've had a scenario once when the first time we did this, the um, the simulated patient has some rather lacy underwear on, and I can tell you it made a lot of the uh, a lot of the people really nervous when they were doing that trauma evaluation. And like I said, they have a lot of nerves already. We don't need to make it worse for them. Another issue with the trauma medical is we're, we're trying to make the same scenario for everybody, the same testing for everybody. So the first candidate goes in, sees the patient for the very first time, but then the rest of them have seen them out getting donuts or hanging out talking to them and they can see the moulage and know what the patient looks like already. It's not the same evaluation for every candidate. So you need to keep that simulated patient kind of under wraps, either wrapped up literally, which we've done in the past. We've had them keep a robe on or wrap up in a towel or a sheet or just keep them away from the candidates during the test need to watch for this, mostly for the trauma because there's some, most of them are time critical about how long they have to initiate transfer. And then we'll come and talk about the form later, but the form is a piece of paper where you mark things down, not necessarily you have to start at the top and work all your way to the bottom in that order. And again, we have some people that feel like that is a linear, must do step one, then step two, then step three, then step four. Most of it is you do the skills, not so much that how you do them in every, you have to do them in a certain uh, chronological order. We'll take a look at the trauma form. That seems to be one of the big ones. And even on that form, they say you may do some of these lower things at the same time you're doing the upper things when you do the evaluation. Ventilatory management is to make sure you can do that. You can ventilate the patient, either the supraglottic airway or with an intubation and an alternative airway at the paramedic level. So no big surprises in this one. You don't have to determine, should I intubate? It is, you're going to go into the station and you are going to intubate the patient. The big issues we see in here are not having all the equipment or having too much equipment in the stations. When you get your information for the station, it's going to have an equipment list on there about here's what you need to have. That needs to be in there for every for every station and not extra stuff. Um, here's the reason the extra stuff is not good is that it confuses people when they come in to test. If they have a piece of equipment there they've never seen before sitting there, they're automatically going to think, I must need this for some reason, and the anxiety level goes crazy up. So it's just the equipment that are on that equipment list. It's the only thing that should be in that room when you test. Uh, you need to be able to time delays. So you're going to need to watch with the second hand about how long it takes from the time they ventilate the patient to the time they re return to ventilate the patient. There's a lot of debate on what is an attempt in EMS. When do you attempt an intubation? Uh, the National Registry does define it for the purposes of testing as when a laryngoscope is placed in the mouth, that's an attempt. So if you go in and look around and don't try to put the tube in, that was an attempt to intubate. Uh, their logic there is that the blade is what causes a lot of the trauma if, there's, if someone's going to tra traumatize an airway. So putting the blade in is the problem, not so much the actual intubation and passing the tube in there. So make sure your students know that too. They, don't, they realize they don't have one free one just to go look around. And then having the equipment prepared the same way for every candidate. It talks about what can be hooked up, what can't be hooked up. If it's not hooked up for the first one, it can't be hooked up for anybody because they all have to have the same consistent exam. Oral station is just done by the paramedic. It's really a, a sit and talk and think station. 
They're going to be given a scenario, they have to do an assessment, they have to come with a diagnosis, figure out a plan for the patient. They'll have to answer some questions about the underlying issues going on with the patient. It's, it's really kind of a fun one to evaluate, I think. It's one of my favorite stations to evaluate. A lot of times they end up putting the medical director for the program in for the station. They'll fill that in because it's a lot like the oral boards that they do for medicine. Common issues with the oral station is not having the divider set up appropriately. There's a three page, three or four page scenario that you have and there's a divider set up so the candidate will not see that. You also have to have scratch paper available so they can make notes as they're going through the scenario. You need to make sure you collect that paper when they're done. That doesn't leave the room and get shared with anybody else. Uh, you got to be careful as the evaluator not to give nonverbal clues, positive or negative. That's really hard to do. Uh, you want to kind of acknowledge, yeah, you did the right thing. You can't. You just have to sit and listen. You can't steer them one way or the other. And you also have to do a little role playing because you're going to play in either the patient or a bystander as they're asking questions about allergies and what happened. You're going to kind of give them give them that information coming from the patient or coming from the bystander. So a little acting class goes into it also. IV and medication starts, evaluate their ability to start an IV and give an IV bolus, since these are skills both those levels do now. Um, common issues, a lot like the airway station, is everything in there, is everything consistent for every candidate? They all have the bags spiked the same way, they have the same things to choose from. This is one of those stations you end up going through a lot of supplies for. Uh, the skill exam replaces the patient, and then you have to make sure you track time because they have a certain amount of time to get that IV initiated. Now, if they fail the IV station in this one, they automatically fail the BOLA station. So they don't get an IV initiated in six minutes, they automatically fail the BOLA station too because they can't do it because the IV is not initiated. But they get the IV initiated, but then they do the BOLUS incorrectly, they pass the IV station, and when they retest, they only have to retest the BOLA station. Pediatric skills, dealing with pediatric airways, and getting IO infusion started. Uh, same issues we see with the IV in the airway is the equipment right there. We don't allow chicken legs. Registry does not allow that in the National Registry test, mostly because of the salmonella issue that's involved with that and making people sick. This is one station where you may have to step in, and I had this happen to me when I was evaluating a station when I was teaching at Mercy. Uh, this is one station where an individual could hurt themselves when they do it. I uh, actually, and again, I saw this done. Canada comes in, cups the lower leg in their hand, and starts to drive the needle into the tibia while cupping it. And if they go through, they're going to go right in their hand. So they have something like that happen. You can stop the station, tell them, no, it's unsafe practice. You, you can't do that. In the cardiac station, the EMT is going to just do a cardiac arrest AAD use. The paramedic is going to do static and dynamic cardiology. Uh, that's going to evaluate their ability to interpret managed cardiac arrhythmia or arrest. The difference between dynamic and static, static is a prepared EKG tracing where they just look at the tracing, they have a scenario, they have to deter, they have to do two things, they have to diagnose or have to identify the rhythm and then they have to come up with the treatment for that rhythm if the, and the patient scenario. So if they misidentify the rhythm, they don't get any of the points for the treatment because they don't know what rhythm they're treating. Uh, and then they get partial points for the rhythm or for the treatments. We'll look at that later. Uh, the biggest issue I have seen with this one is evaluators not completing the form correctly. Uh, writing down the wrong rhythm, they identify the wrong rhythm, but then giving points for the treatment, which they can't do if they misidentify the rhythm. And then the documentation request on the static cardiology asks that you only document incorrect 
treatments and people write down every treatment done. We just want the incomplete treatments. Sometimes people will flip over and write on the back what they do and then just flip the over for the incorrect ones that had incorrect treatments and on the actual documentation form. I'll show you that form here in a little bit. Mobilization, make sure the patient has to be average adult height and weight, which we've talked about earlier. Uh, seated mobilization, body secured before the head secured. And then the bleeding control shock management, really I'm, I'm about to take this issue off because I think we've got this now. Uh, for a long time, we never wanted to see a tourniquet used. Now it's like, yes, yes, use the tourniquet. So I put in use of tourniquet just because that's a holdover from old dogs like me that have to remember that tourniquets are good now. So the evaluation materials, let me just show you a couple things here. I need to get over to my other screen and drag some stuff over. So this is the National Registry website, and the National, National Registry does not hide anything for anybody about what's going to be done and what's going to be assessed. It's all, all the assessment forms are available on the website. What isn't is are the actual scenarios that are tested. So here's the EMT basic EMT uh, psychomotor examination. You go over here to uh, National EMS certification examinations, go to psychomotor. There's the ones for the EMR. Here's the advanced ones, and there's a couple I want to point out here. Let me find patient assessment trauma. So this is the form you'll fill out if you're going to evaluate this, the patient assessment trauma. You, again, we talk about you need to complete this correctly. There's, you need to document the candidate's name. A lot of times they're going to have a name tag on when I was doing the stations or when I was doing the testing, they would have a name tag on. Make sure you clearly get that written down with the right name so it goes to the right pile back in the tally room. If there's 50 piles of paper for 50 candidates that day, there's a lot of people trying to figure out what goes where and it's easy to lose things at the best of times. So making sure things are written clearly is important. Your name goes over here as the examiner. Again, make sure it's written clearly so we can figure out who it is if we need to go track somebody down. Mostly later in the day when people start moving stations as we retest, if we need to go find somebody, we may not know what station they're in or who's doing a certain station. The date, sign it when you're done, and then the scenario number. The scenario number is important because when they, if an individual has a retest, we don't let them retest the same scenario they did. So we have to make sure they're going to have to go to a different scenario. So that's why we need that. Document the time started in the trauma, and then the points issues. So if they do it, they get a point. If they don't do it, they don't get the point. So they take and verbalize body substance isolation precautions. You give them a point. If they determine the scene is safe, the situation is safe, you give them the point. We don't do any partial points because it makes math hard. It's kind of binary, yes or no. Until you get down to things like airway. So if they do the insert and assess the, uh, open and assess the airway, they get a point for that. If the insert and adjunct is indicated, as indicated, if it's not indicated and they don't do one, then you get a point for it because it wasn't indicated. You give them two points if they do everything. If they only do one of those things, you give them one point. So you don't get partial points. You don't give a point five, but you can give a one or a two there. Assessing the breathing, assessing circulation. And here's what I'm talking about where it's not a linear thing. You see inspects mouth and it gives you a double asterisk. You go down. Where is the double asterisk? Oh, here it is. Areas donated by a double asterisk may be integrated within sequence of primary survey. So they check, inspect the mouth and nose up here in airway. They don't have to necessarily do it again down here to get the points. They'll get the two points up here for airway, and then they'll get the two points down here, or the point down here for taking care of that up above. Same thing as doing eyes for pearl. So they check pearl up here. They don't necessarily have to do it again down here as it comes down.
Now the critical criteria, and then the time ended, and total it up, how many points they got. That's where the magic decoder ring comes in effect is with the number of points. Then the critical criteria. So when you check a critical criteria, you need to document in the back the rationale for, for checking the critical criteria. And sometimes it seems like, well, why am I having to write anything? Because it's pretty self-explanatory. We still want the exact reason why you did why you checked this. So checking failure to take a verbalized body substance isolation precautions doesn't mean you turn over and said did not take or verbalize body substance isolation precautions. It's they did not put on gloves. They did not put on a goggles. They what did they do that made you check that box? No. Fair to voice and ultimately provide high concentration of oxygen. Did they not give any oxygen? Or do they put oxygen on by nasal cannula? What was the reason you're checking they failed to provide high concentration of oxygen? Because the Proctor needs that information when they look at it or things go in dispute about why did I fail this or did I really fail this, that documentation is what's going to support your check marks there. So please, please, please make sure you check, give us some documentation on those check marks. Let me show you the Static cardiology too, because that's another one we have issues with. There we go. So same top stuff. Don't need to worry about this anymore because we're not doing any intermediate 99s anymore for testing. So no points for treatment may be awarded if the diagnosis is incorrect. Only document incorrect responses and spaces provided. So they give you the wrong diagnosis, write down what they did diagnose, zero points. No matter if they treated this thing flawlessly after that, zero points because they did not get the diagnosis correct. So number two, they get diagnosis correct, they treated it half right, they can get a point. Document what they either did wrong or didn't do to get the two points and your information you have will kind of tell you how the points are split up, what they need to do to get the points. Any questions on any of that? Question here at DMAC, Joe. Yeah. Joe, you know, a lot of times you know, in doing the ACLS um, algorithms, participants or the candidates will get nervous and they may misspeak, knowing that they're seeing V fib, but they say V TAC or, or vice versa. Is there any latitude given for the evaluators if, if they really if they come rolling right off and say this is V fib and here's the treatment for it and they, they roll right through it? Uh, but it was V, it was pulse was VTAC. Is there a difference for that? Do we have any leeway for that? Not unless they identify they did it wrong and they really meant VFib. Okay. Yeah, they, if they misdiagnose, if they miss, if they misdiagnose it, and the only way you know what they think it is is what they tell you they think it is, um, they don't get the point for it. Okay, thanks. They'll get another opportunity to succeed, is how I like to put it. They don't fail the test, they get another opportunity to succeed. Not until they've taken the station six times do they fail it. Any other questions? Now let's talk a little about the materials, what you're going to have to work with. You're going to be given a packet as an evaluator. And you need to take some time, look through that packet, make sure you're familiar with it. If you're doing the oral station, they actually recommend, if it's the first time you've done it, to reserve an hour to review that station before you start bringing candidates into it. There's, it's pretty in-depth on the oral station. 
So there's going to be instructions for you as an evaluator. And also, if you're on the advanced level evaluation, you're going to get a uh, you're going to have a little reading that will occur at the beginning of the evaluation. Now, if you've done this for a while, you're going to think, oh, do I have to listen to this again? Yes, you do. It's amazing to me how many times I've read that thing to people and then they go in and do things that either they don't do things that they were told to do or they do do things they were they were told not to do. It's That reading is important because they're trying to do, again, a fair objective, repeatable, same every time type of test. So that's part of making that happen. For the EMR, EMT, I believe they have you read those to yourself. Read that stuff through. Make sure you didn't forget something you thought you knew or there wasn't a change at some point and now they want you to do something somehow differently. Likewise, there's insistent instructions and patient instructions. Read in the advanced skills, they have you read those to the assistant and the patient. You may have read it a thousand times every time you evaluate it. Maybe your assistants or your value or your patients first time in there. So make sure they know exactly what their role is by reading that information to them. There'll be an equipment list we kind of talk about already. Make sure you have the equipment that is required to be in that station. If you've got extra equipment, get it out of there. It causes so much confusion for these people. And again, they're so stressed out. It is a hard day. Think back to what your practical evaluation was like and how you wanted to throw up. Don't make it worse for them. Uh, there is the uh, scenario which must be kept secure. That should be with you at all times. If it's not with you, it should be with your site proctor. Don't leave that thing laying around. If you have one of those things disappear during the course of the test, they'll shut that test down. Nobody else will be allowed to test and they may invalidate all the scores that day. Don't be the person responsible for that happening. That's, that's bad. Uh, and if you do take it with you and you go to the bathroom, remember everybody else is probably taking that bathroom too, so don't lick that inf information. It's, it's probably gross. As bad as your cell phone, probably. Uh, got a question from Iowa Valley. Iowa Valley, we'll come back to that so I can find exactly what it is you're looking for here in a little bit. Um, dispatch information. There'll be a couple things you have to read to the candidate. There's going to be some information about the station, then we kind of kick off the dispatch information. You will read that multiple times during the course of the day, over and over and over again. You're going to get tired of it. You know what it says, you're sick of hearing it, but it's the candidate's first time to be in that station. Read that to them so they get the same treatment every other candidate gets coming in. And there's going to be your evaluation forms. In different places, do it different ways. A lot of the places will have runners. They'll come by and collect those when you don't have people in with you. So they take them to the tally room, and they can be tallied up to figure out who, how people are doing, who's passing, who's failing. Uh, your, whoever's in charge of your site that day will talk about that a little bit. So when those are handed to you, all those become your responsibility. They must be returned to the proctor, and you cannot make copies of those. Uh, that gets you in trouble, too. The registry does, those are copyrighted materials by the National Registry, and they protect them very, very closely. And uh, we would probably be involved with that, too, if something were to go wrong. So I had a question from Iowa Valley about the medical station. Oh. And something it says on there, and I'll be honest, I haven't looked at them for a while, so I need to go back and look. Patient assessment medical. And is this on the advanced or on the on the EMT one, Iowa Valley? I 
Okay. I think it, 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 I need to go back and look at this stuff. It's been a while since I've actually been and done a test, and I think it's described in the handbook, but uh, my understanding of that would be that if you're asking where does it radiate, how far does it radiate, how does it, it's just asking questions to explore all these questions. Does that, does that make sense to Iowa Valley? I think we're on the same track on that one. Let me flip through just make sure I didn't miss any. All right. So to summarize, if I had to get you some key points to take away from this, other than proper documentation all that, we're, we've got you there so we do a fair, unbiased, objective evaluation of these people because this is this is part of what's going to give them permission to practice in our profession. So we want to make sure they are minimally competent and we want to be fair about figuring out whether they have the minimal competency or not. We want to make sure there's no conflicts of interest when you test people. So if you feel you may have a conflict of interest, visit with somebody on site so they can either determine whether it's a conflict or um, or find somebody else to test that station. Uh, you know, to me, it's a lot. If I if I'm wondering, is there a conflict? It probably is good to err on the side of not evaluating that individual. And let's see, there was a third point. Oh, about filling out the forms like medical documentation. Make sure you have that thing completely filled out and documented, and everything's tallied up, and everything makes sense to it, and legibly where you can read it. So those, those would be my big three takeaways from all this other stuff I have. So I'll be glad to answer any other questions anybody may have. Joe, I think Iowa Valley had another question regarding the uh, medical patient assessment form. Uh, okay, what? Secondary assessment, there's five points. Let me look. I don't have it in front of me right now. Secondary assessment. I have to go back and look into that one. I know there's some information in the instructions, but I don't have those in front of me right now of how those five points are distributed. I probably have to look in the handbook a little bit to figure that one out. And uh, Marla should have access to that there at Iowa Valley. And I think she probably has, if, you, if Marla, if you're there and you don't have that, let me know and we'll get you set up with that. Any other questions I can ask, answer for anybody? Joe, I know the one situation that we've come, um, it's come up as a question to our students, particularly our advanced EMT students, um, and I think it's the pediatric airway compromise station. <laughs> Sorry. Can you give me a second to find that one? Or pediatric respiratory compromise. Yep. And there's, there's been just a lot of concerns um, for our students because they have to come in, do a quick assessment of their station, you know, and right at the top it says, you know, verbalizes body substance isolation, which we know that doesn't have to be linear. Uh, but they have to come in, assess their patient, 
put on the pulse ox and then recognize that their patient is standing at 82%, at which point then they're going to ventilate. But then a critical fail down below is if they don't get that all done in 30 seconds. And that's kind of a lot to do in 30 seconds. So selecting proper device, testing oxygen, administer oxygen, checking pulse. Oh, there it is right there. So these two steps from the time they identify 82%? Uh, no, it says from the time they put on their gloves. So <clears throat> It says failure to initiate oxygenation within 30 seconds of identified respiratory compromise. Um, maybe it's down here. I see anything about... Uh, well, maybe they Because this would be the point. Oh, you know what? They've redone this. So, okay. Because um, the last one we had was like 2011 or something. Um, Iowa Valley says it's a critical fail. Yeah, this says to identify respiratory compromise, so yeah. right in here is where you would do that. And then you only need to get down to here. Right. To it, get it, it looks like they've redone it in 2014, so maybe. Um, maybe I need to reprint my sheets. Because it used to say um, within 30 seconds. And I did call National Registry and say, and ask them, you know, how we do this. And they said, well, just have your students put gloves on um, right before they're going to touch the patient instead of at the beginning of the station. Yeah, it looks like they clarified that now. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, because you look down here, they don't even require you to do body temps isolation until identifying failure so that would even be down to here to do gloves so yeah I think they've redone this one yeah that's good that one was kind of a booger I have a value got a note says it's a critical fail are we I'm not sure what we're talking about there is that Talking about the 30 seconds. It was before. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not following what we're. Okay. Any other questions or anything? Any comments anybody has? Well, I will wrap up, let you guys go. I want to thank everybody for doing coming to do this tonight. I want to thank you immensely for agreeing to be an evaluator. It is kind of a thankless, very hard job, but it's important for, I know the training programs appreciate when you guys can evaluate for them. I appreciate it greatly because you're helping us evaluate these people who are going to have a certification in the state of Iowa, and you guys are really kind of one of the lines that are protecting the patients in Iowa by evaluating these people and determining whether they have achieved minimal level competency. So I, I I appreciate it greatly for you doing this for us. So if there's no other questions, I'll hang out here for a little bit with my headphones on as I pack things up here, but everybody get out and go home. Your training program, once they make you do whatever else they're going to make you do, they'll put in a request for endorsement, and that will be popping up as, as they come in. I'll approve those. So have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Joe.